This is the end of March 2020 in the United States. The U.S. is currently number one in identified cases of COVID-19 globally. New York is in the epicenter of this pandemic, with New York City registering about half of those COVID-19 positive cases. The relevance to the speech language pathologist um, is mixed based on our roles. Our colleagues that are in the schools uh, are now forced to provide services via telepractice. Our colleagues in home care are now using telehealth um, uh, to provide services. And those of us in skilled nursing facilities and in acute care settings are actually at the front lines, seeing patients that are COVID-19 positive, um, and mostly for clinical swallow assessments. And that's what we'll talk about today. I'm Luis F. Raquelme, speech language pathologist. I thank the NFOSD and its leadership for inviting me to record this video. Um, there have been questions about who we're seeing. Let's understand that this is all very new to us. This is not a patient population that we um, were trained to work with. So many of our usual protocols are being uh, brought to question or being tested. Um, so with that in mind, we're moving forward and sharing what we can. Um, I think it's important that we not judge each other, but help each other uh, in this moment of crisis because right now, while we are being challenged to provide the best services possible, this is also an opportunity, an opportunity for us to show uh, how important we are at the front lines and what the true value of the acute care speech language pathologist is. So right now, what we're seeing over this past week and a half to two weeks um, in New York City um, have been referrals for mostly for patients post-extubation, uh, for patients that might be decompensated from battling uh, this virus, and um, also uh, patients who present with um, a myriad of respiratory deficits uh, because of the virus, uh, not all uh, post-extubation. What we're seeing right now is that about 30% of the COVID positive patients that have been admitted um, are on mechanical ventilation. Um, those numbers may vary around the country. We will see how this uh, pandemic uh, uh, guides uh, practice and what we see uh, in terms of the epidemiology here. So how are we providing these services? Are we using up all the protective personal equipment uh, that we are complaining about being uh, in shortage? Um, what we have developed, uh, and I've been sharing and collaborating with the speech pathology leaders, has been basically three types of exam. Uh, one is uh, the direct exam, where we have to go into the room. Uh, these patients are in isolation rooms. Um, with the protective gear and conducting our clinical swallow assessments. Uh, the, others, uh, the other approach we've taken is what we're calling an indirect exam, uh, where uh, we have two options there. The indirect exam, where we collaborate with the nurse and the nurse who's already in his or her PPE are going into the room and conducting parts of our assessment. And then that along with a chart review, discussion with the uh, with the nurse and with the uh, medical team, uh, we then provide recommendations. Or the case where maybe the patient isn't ready, and so with a chart review and discussion with the medical team, including nursing, uh, the physicians, the respiratory therapists, et cetera, we can make recommendations. Um, we have to be very careful how we're documenting these, of course. A direct exam would be our usual. The indirect exams, uh, clearly we are not uh, billing for those. Um, however, um, we are writing a note and um, we are listing recommendations, which puts our licensure and certification on the line. Therefore, we have to coach those uh, notes very carefully, stating that uh, the direct exam was not conducted and why we conducted an indirect exam. And that's how we are um, right now uh, moving forward. 
what we're doing, uh, and just yesterday we had a call with the uh, speech language pathology leadership in our network, and we're starting to share it with some of our other colleagues here in New York City, is kind of tracking who are the patients that we are seeing directly that require us going into the room, and who are the ones that we are uh, comfortable providing recommendations for uh, indirectly. Now, notice that those that today might undergo an indirect exam might be ready for a direct exam in a day or two. So we also need to provide follow-up services to um, all of these uh, patients. It's not your typical population. What we know about extubation, for example, um, doesn't always play out here. Uh, we are seeing folks with multiple comorbidities um, and maybe our, our typical kind of patient in intensive care units, but then we're also seeing folks that are basically healthy adults, no major comorbidities, who were intubated for three or four days, now are extubated, um, still present with some respiratory compromise. So how do we balance our clinical practice there? Um, in terms of um, providing some um, oral nutrition um, and starting to work in that uh, direction or, or provide the least restrictive diet possible while maintaining uh, patient safety and efficiency of that swallow. Um, uh, questions have come up about the timing of assessment uh, post-extubation, and we're, we're not seeing a pattern yet because of the mixture of, uh, of the patient population. I think we're leaning more on their respiratory status um, to make those determinations. Um, as we gain more experience and we track and share this data, I think we'll know, we'll know more. Um, we know that um, uh, instrumental exams have been a big question in the clinical practice of speech pathologists. Um, we right now are not conducting any uh, fees exams, no endoscopic swallowing exams. Uh, patients that are in isolation or COVID positive, we are not taking down to radiology for video fluoroscopic exams. And, um, and so that really puts the pressure on clinicians to make decisions, take risks, make an initial temporary recommendation um, based on our clinical swallow exam. So um, we really need to make sure that we're comfortable with that as we move forward and that we can use the evidence that's available to us regarding um, what's the risk of aspirating some water in the presence of a clear oral cavity um, and so on. Uh, we have seen the guidelines that CMS uh, posted about a week ago um, uh, as well as the American Academy of Otolaryngology regarding the increased viral density in the nasal and pharyngeal cavities. And so that has kind of made us really pull back on the idea of endoscopic exams, et cetera. Uh, we're questioning, um, is our clinical swallow exam an aerosolized procedure? The patient might cough. Um, well, I would suggest don't induce a cough, uh, but patients might reflexively cough. And so again, maintaining our distance, using the proper gear, um, our team is making sure that if we're going in the room, we are wearing the proper gear, uh, protective equipment uh, that is, um, is required. For the community, I'll, I'll tell you, seeing how New York City has changed right now, um, my description right now is a ghost town. Uh, the subways are fairly empty. Uh, some of us have to still ride the subway uh, to get to work on the days that we're um, assigned to be in the hospital. So um, uh, certainly, you know, using the mask, um, maintaining social distance, that is just, it, it's already proving to be um, a major factor um, in, in really um, uh, flattening that curve. Um, and that's really what we're going for. Using hand sanitizer often um, and washing your hands, nothing like soap and water. There's no way around that one. Um, I would, however, um, uh, caution you about using gloves um, out in public. My concern there has been that as you know, if you're wearing gloves out in public, you are just collecting more and more germs, could be the virus, and then suddenly you bring your hands to your face to remove your mask. Um, and now, boom, you have all that on your face. And we're talking about not 
getting um, uh, getting your hands close to your face um, if they're dirty. So be careful um, with that. Persons with swallowing disorders, I would say do stay in touch with your clinicians, even though many outpatient clinics are closed. Um, there are still phone numbers uh, where you can reach the speech pathology team. Um, if those are not working, call the hospital main switchboard and have them connect you with the inpatient speech pathology team. They'll know um, how to reach your outpatient clinician and uh, be able to answer your questions. Um, Colleagues, this is all new to us. We are on a day-by-day -day learning process here. I think more than ever, we need to learn from each other. We need to stick together. We need to agree to disagree because that certainly will happen. And we need to continue to provide these services. Don't let fear take over. Uh, be empowered with the knowledge of what is really happening. Uh, talk to your hospital administration. Find out what your colleagues in other uh, professions at your hospital are doing. And do protect yourselves. Um, and let's track what we're doing because pretty soon we'll need to start sharing this um, and learning from this process. So stay calm, stay healthy, and be safe. Thank you very much, NFOSD, for this opportunity, and we'll see how this continues to evolve.